Okay, it's now 11 o'clock Auckland Unitarian time. Um, welcome to you. Uh, before we get into the service, just a couple of points. One is we don't know how long we'll be at level two, hopefully not much longer. Um, but until we can get to level one, we have to do it this way only. Um, and that's because we don't have enough space to keep the social distance required of level two. So uh, if, if this many people came, we could pull it off, but we would never know how many people came. Um, so we're gonna come. So uh, hopefully this will be the, the la first and last time we have to do it this way only. We will continue to do Zoom services uh, once we're back in the building, but not until then. Um, the only people that can use the building are our groups small groups and renters who can manage complying with level two requirements. So we are open to that extent, but um, it, it just, we can't, I can't figure out how to make it work on stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but as you may have figured out, since we've done a variety of, we've had Rachel last week, this week we have Shireen, who's going to be our worship leader. Now she has, Shireen has been the, in years past, a worship leader many times, but that was in a pre-technological world. And so I'll be doing backup uh, and hopefully I won't screw that up. Um, the, uh, and we will, uh, she is going to share with us um, some very interesting stories about her trip to India. And I won't say much more than that, except that as, a country that has had the same empire rulers, uh, we probably can draw certain uh, parallels to our own experience here, uh, as well as gain the knowledge that she is sharing today. So I'm going to hand off to her and this disappear from your screen. Um, Shireen, it's all yours. Well, no my, hadi my. Welcome to this Zoom service for the Un Auckland Unitarian Church, where we Unitarians and friends have worshiped for more than 120 years. Our opening words are from Francis Rees Day. We gather here to find a resting place from the busyness of our lives. We come seeking a larger vision and a greater purpose that we may give direction to our daily affairs. We come seeking to be awakened, enlightened and renewed. We know that the power to gain all these things lies within us, but we need this place and this time and these people to remind us of our power and of the possibilities. This place becomes a virtual sanctuary when we gather in it. Together, we make it sacred, for it is a place where we seek connection with the larger vision and the larger hope. Let us open to the sacred within us. Let us ready ourselves to stretch and reach beyond our normal grasp. Just before we light the chalice, I want to give a brief introduction to why I've chosen Albert Schweitzer. 
And when I first gingerly dipped my toe into coming to our church around 1983, I was curious to see that there was a photograph of Albert Schweitzer hanging in our, for in our foyer. Well, I later learned that this humanitarian, theologian, philosopher, organist, musicologist, physician, scholar, and Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Albert Schweitzer was a lifelong Unitarian, Luther, sorry, Lutheran who challenged both the secular and the tra traditional Christian views of Jesus. He was offered life membership of the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Larger Fellowship in the 1960s. And he accepted saying, it was because your broad sympathy and understanding of the liberal religious position and your faith in action. So please join me if you have a, uh, a candle um, and light the chalice with me while we listen to Albert Schweitzer's words. At times, our own light goes out and it is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. Now, Clay, uh, is, well, I think you're all muted, but we're now going to sing our wonderful hymn, Spirit of Life. Clay. Our time for all ages is, uh, is a story about a giraffe that can't dance. It's by jo uh, Giles Andrea and illustrated delightfully by Guy Parker Rees. Play. Well, our Koha hymn is number 12 of life that maketh all things new. Play. That was an old Christian hymn uh, that I used to sing when I was uh, in, a, in a previous incarnation, a, um, an Anglican, but the words of course have been changed. The tune is the same. Well, my topic this morning is from Gurdjieff to West Bengal, a story of the revival of the traditional textiles of India after the inglorious empire of the British Raj. And that is the title of a book by Sashi Tharoor. So the talk is an introduction to one story, and there are many, of how the ancient arts of weaving and embroidery are being revived among the ancient uh, uh, amongst the artisans of Gurjarat and West Bengal in India. So the story is told through my eyes, which were opened on a traditional textiles tour to India in 2019. I joined Joji Jacobs' traditional textiles of India tour uh, because I really liked what he'd written about the intent of the tour. He is an Indian himself who now lives in New Zealand and was the most delightful tour guide. Well, it was dazzling. India was drenched in color, the vibrancy of the people, the fascinating accommodation, including the 19th century uh, Itachuna Rabari in West Bengal, or the luxurious Taj Mahal Hotel in Lucknow, the terracotta temples in West Bengal, the idol makers in the workshops of Kolkata, the stunning traditional weaving and embroideries and the breathtaking ancient step wells whose stories are carved into the stone and pillars and the Shambhal river ride alive with crocodiles and gharials. I loved that. All of these will linger long in my memory. But today I wanted to talk about one of the major reasons for my choosing this tour over the many others. And that was the emphasis that, that Joji had put on social justice, 
on supporting the revival of ancient weaving and embroidery arts by the artisans of India that were almost lost due to the deliberate, brutal, repressive policies of firstly the British East India Company and later the British Raj. So to prepare myself with a little knowledge before the trip, I read William Dalrymple's delightful book, The City of Gins, A Year in Delhi, that was published in 2003. And Sashi Theroux's illuminating book, The Inglorious Empire, published in 2017, that describes the atrocities and the cruel governance over the Indian subcontinent during the time of the British Raj. Some of you might have attended the interview with Shashi Theroux at the Writers' Festival here in Auckland in 2018. He is an Indian academic, an MP, a former United Nations uh, Under Secretary General, and finished second behind uh, Ban Ki-moon of South Korea in the 2006 election for the UN Secretary General. Well, this gave me some context to fully appreciate the revival of the artistic skill and the intricacies of, of the traditional weaving, dyeing and embroideries done by the village artisans and embroiderers that we visited across parts of Gujarat and West Bengal. My interest, of course, was highlighted by getting to know the Indian students that our church offered sanctuary to in February 2017. Vikram, Sonia, Kwashish and Daria, now living in South Auckland, are now our friends. Change slide, please. Well, this is a, this is a photograph of, um, uh, of uh, Asashi and, um, and William Dalrymple. If we go on one slide uh, and we'll go to the next slide. And this is a clip by Dr. Sashi Theroux. Over to you, Clay. Next slide, please, Cl please, Clay. Here is William Dow. There, no, there will be. There will be. <laughs> Thank you. Next slide, please. Well, on the first day um, after we arrived in Almanabad, our introduction to these traditional ancient arts of weaving and embroidery began with a visit to the Calico Museum in Ahmanabad, and it was an awe-inspiring collection of religious textiles, South India bronzes, Jana art, royal tents, costumes and carpets and furnishings from the Mughal courts, as well as a range of beautiful ethnographic textiles, and you can see some of them on the left and the, the bronze um, articles on the right. Next slide, please. From there, we went to the, the Shrujan Museum in Kutch. Uh, Shrujan means creativity in Sanskrit. Uh, this is a not-for-profit organization which works with over 3,000 500 local craftswomen spread over a hundred remote villages in Kutch, and the aim is to revitalize the ancient craft of hand embroidery. The museum has a wonderful collection of examples of the women's work, showing a huge range of styles and traditions that are specific to each community. The women are given a fair price for their work, which helps them to secure a better future for the women and their families. And I bought some exquisite work that I will always treasure and a pure silk hand embroidered purse with a fine bead strip I bought is here on the left. I wanted to say too that I was, um, I was actually shocked at how cheap the goods were. And I remember talking to, to Joji and he said, uh, I said, really, you know, the people who can afford to come on these trips can afford to pay more than this. And uh, he said, well, it might be a little to you, but to them, it's a lot, which I found quite sobering. Next slide, please. 
This is, um, um, I didn't take this photograph myself. This is, um, this is one that I did print from the internet, but most, um, most of the, uh, the photographs are the ones that I took, um, in fact, nearly all of them. But this is an example of the most beautiful uh, traditional weaving, uh, which is specific. Uh, the Bukhodi uh, is a traditional craft in, in, uh, in, in Gurjurat. It's very fine and very beautiful. Next slide, please. From there, um, we were still, still staying in Gurjurat. Um, this one is of a master weaver, indigo dyer and weaver. And these are the photographs that I took of, um, of him and his son. Um, the image on the left of, uh, of, is of um, Venka Vishramvali, which is his full name, using that traditional spinning wheel that was also used by Gandhi. And later on, we did visit Gandhi's ashram, uh, and there was a demonstration of weaving using that ancient tool. What's interesting is that uh, Vankar mixes goat, silk, and merino wool that he imports from New Zealand and weaves the most exquisite shawls, saris, and other goods. On the right is his delicious little son who demonstrated the slow traditional process of immersing the shanks of spun wool into a series of indigo dye vats that are sunk into the floor. That's just one that you see, but there are a whole series of them. Uh, many of the traditional weavers still use the ancient natural method extracting the dye from the plants of the genus Indigofera, which are native to the tropics, notably the Indian subcontinent. And each time the shank is immersed, it is hung up to dry, and it will go through several of these processes until the exact indigo shade is set. And indigo is the oldest known fabric and dates back 6,000 years ago and was discovered in 2009 in Peru. Or many Asian countries such as India, Japan and Southeast Asian nations have used indigo as a dye, particularly silk, silk dye for centuries. And it remained a luxury commodity in Europe throughout the Middle Ages and India was a primary supplier of indigo to Europe as early as the Greco-Roman era. And now a synthetic variant is used to dye the ubiquitous blue jeans. And I did go to a, an exhibition uh, that celebrated indigo and one wall was covered with, um, <laughs> with blue jeans. It was quite a stunning exhibition. Change slides, please. From there, we went to the Kala Raksha Trust. Um, and on the left are so, uh, uh, is a photograph of some of the embroideries from that trust. And on the right, one from a village uh, collective, which was not far from uh, the Indigo, uh, sorry, from the uh, Kala Ra Rakasha Trust. So women's collectives ensure the regular income for the craftswomen and men. And these include the Kala Raksha Trust, an artisan initiative where income generated from the exquisitely embroidered products are sold directly by the artisans themselves, thus linking them directly to the market. The cooperative also offers the workers integrated preventative health and basic education programs. And their work is sold in a delightful complex of traditional Ram buildings called Manga, which are unique to the Kutch region in Gurjurat. The cooperative is a model for community development and is locally managed and operates using solar power. So as I said, the photograph on the left shows the Kala Raksha women working on their fine embroidery. And they were very happy for us to take photographs of them. And on the right are a group of two generations of Hodka village women and the 12 year old girl and her grandmother selling their wares directly to, to us, uh, uh, the visitors in their village compound. And I must say that 12 year old was a very fine saleswoman. Change slide, please, Clay. Um, this is a photograph that I didn't take. I forgot there were actually two, two or three that I didn't take myself. Um, 
but this is a this is a photograph of the traditional bunga dwellings. Could we have the next slide, please? So this is the interior of the bunga at Machafil Ran restaurant in Kutch in Gujarat, and this was my bedroom, and I felt like um, a maharaji when I was in this room. It was glorious. And I loved the, um, the beautiful sort of folk art around the walls. And after the 1819 earthquake that caused severe damage to the lives and property, the people of Kutch came up with the circular design of bungas, which have been in use now for about 200 years. Even after the severe earthquake of 2001, it was seen that despite being very close to the epicenter of the earthquake, Bunga stood firm while many other buildings were devastated. Perhaps some of our town planners and builders in New Zealand can take um, a bit of advice from Gurjurat. Next slide, please. Now, I couldn't resist uh, including the step wells. Um, on the left is the Rankiki Vav, which means the Queen step well at uh, Patan in Gurjurat built on the banks of the Sarawati River. Excuse me, I need a drink. It was initially built um, as a memorial to a king in the 11th century AD. Step wells are a distinctive form of subterranean water resource and storage systems on the Indian subcontinent and have been constructed since the third millennium BC. You can perhaps not get quite a, uh, uh, the impact that I got standing right on the top and looking down because they're huge constructions and they evolved over time from what was basically a sandy pit to elaborate uh, to, to, and developed into elaborate multi-story work of art and architecture. Rankiki Vav was built at the height of the craftsman's ability in stepwell construction. It was designed like an inverted temple, highlighting the sanctity of water. And it's divided into seven levels of stairs with sculptural panels of high artistic quality, more than 500 principal sculptures and over a thousand minor ones combining religious, mythological and secular injury, uh, sorry, imagery, often referencing literary works. And the fourth level is the deepest and leads to a rectangular tank, 9.5 meters by 9.4 at a depth of 23 meters. And the photograph on the right is of the Hindu sun, sun temple at Budira, another step well dedicated to the solar deity of Sura. And so we were told was built by the wife of the king who built the Ran Kivan Stepwell that you see on the left. Next slide, please, Clay. On the left is an 11th century woman, and I wonder if you can guess what she's actually doing. So I don't keep you hanging there. She's actually applying lipstick and receiving a pedicure, which I thought was amazing. They actually wore lipsticks in the lipstick in the 11th century. On the right is the detail from one of the pillars lining the sides of the Patan step wells. And I was so, um, so overwhelmed with the most beautiful sculptures that I've taken hundreds of photographs of, um, of this particular step well and others. Next slide, please. From, from, um, from the, the, um, the very dusty, dry desert, we flew to New Delhi, uh, which was an oasis of most beautiful um, gardens. And this was the Mura Collective that we visited. And it was set up by Prabhra Gatori and her sister, Kasim Gatori Tiwari. Mura was set up, they said, to provide a workplace environment for inclusion of marginalized women's uh, sorry, I'll say it again, of marginalized groups such as women, as well as those with special needs. We have a lot of women, especially from migrant families working for us at Prava, 
who described their workplace in Delhi as an urban village pocket that has enabled many women who cannot leave their homes with employment and income, she said. Well, on the left is Kusam, the main designer at the Mura Collective, and all the craftswomen wore the most beautiful, colorful, traditional saris and kurtas. I couldn't resist the beauty of their work and bought a handloom cotton kurta. That's me on the right in the foyer of the very grand Taj Mahal, Kolkata. But I have to say, I much preferred the bungas. And I'm actually wearing, I don't know if you can see, but I'm wearing that same kurta today. Well, Kusam's work has earned her and uh, the Mura Collective, her venture, their, their, their venture, both a UNESCO Award for Excellence for Handicrafts in 2008 and the UNESCO Seal of Excellence for Handcrafted Products in South Asia in 2005. From New Delhi, we then flew to West Bengal. Next slide, please. Well, what a difference from New Delhi to West Bengal was such a different climate to the hot, dry deserts of Gurjarat. They were, it was drenched in greenery and was very hot and humid. On the left, we see the interior of the village workshop of a cotton weaver in West Bengal. We visited many like this. Um, you can't quite see it, but I'll show you another slide. Uh, there's a central corridor down the middle and the, uh, the individual weaving stations are uh, dug into the earth. So, uh, and they only actually work from uh, early in the morning till just before it gets really hot. Then they have a rest and come back in the later afternoon when it's much cooler. Uh, and one of the colorful and distinctive designs, which is so different to the ones in Gurjarat is on the right. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this one here is also in West Bengal, and uh, it's, it was very significant because this particular uh, workshop is involved in reviving the once famous Muslim industry, including Rabindranath Saha's work. And in the brief clip that I showed you earlier, Sashi Thoreau talked about the British Raj's cruel destruction of the Bengali fine, unrivaled muslin weaving. And I want to read you an extract from an Indian journalist, a K.R.N. Swami, writing in the Indian Tribune. In the history of textiles, there is no name more famous than that of Dhaka Muslim. In 1875, when Edward VII, the then Prince of Wales, came to Bengal, Sir Abdul Ghani of Dhaka ordered 30 yards of the most superior muslin as a gift to the prince. One yard of this fabric weighed barely 20 grams. And even today, amongst aristocratic families of the Indian subcontinent, Dresses of darker muslin are considered the ultimate in luxury. The word muslin was derived from the name of the city of its origin, Mosul in Iraq. Bengal became famous for the weaving of this cloth. Their weave was so fine that the Egyptian pharaohs used them for wrapping their mummies. And Pliny, the famous Roman historian, refers to one type of, of Indian muslin known as Juna, worn by Roman women of high rank to show off the contours of their bodies. Imperial Rome imported large quantities of this fabric with embroideries done in silver or with silk thread. And this muslin was known as kashida. The variety known as saka e ala was used for the turbans of the Mughal emperors. Now, the picture on the left shows the workshop of Rabindranath Sahar, a muslin weaver who has won a national award for contributing to the revival of the muslin industry. Note Gandhi on the left standing sentinel over his workshop. Rabindranath's grandfather, he told us, fled to the British and gave up his ancient art to avoid having his thumb cut off by the British. But after much research, 
he and his father have rekindled this ancient Bengali art. And the picture on the right is an exquisite and priceless piece of natural muslin and gold piece woven by his grandfather that he kept safe in a, um, in a locked cupboard. And it is over 100 years old. I bought several scarves from this master weaver and gave them to friends and family. And I know that they will always treasure them knowing the history as they do now. Next slide, please. Now I talked about the, uh, the, the structure of the workshops. This was one of the women weavers and uh, she's sitting in the pit uh, and you can see, the, see her at work. And on the right um, is another piece of cloth made in um, uh, Rabindranath's workshop. Next slide, please, Clay. Well, we drove to Kolkata after spending the most amazing 10 days in West Bengal. This shows the, um, the workshop free set. It was, uh, it was started in 1999 by Kerry Ann Hilton, sorry, Kerry and Annie Hilton, who he was a pastor on the North Shore and they left New Zealand with their four children and moved to Kolkata to work and live amongst the poor. Naively, they signed up for an apartment in the middle of the day. And it was only when Kerry, taking a walk around the city, around the area at night, discovered that they had moved into the largest red light area in the city, Songagachi, and their new neighbors were thousands of women forced into prostitution by trafficking and poverty. So what is Freeset? And I'm just quoting here from their, uh, from their website. It's a group of social enterprises focused on creating positive employment opportunities for women affected by sex trafficking in West Bengal. This quote is from their website. Freeset exists for the many women who have never had the choice to be free. We care about the thousands of West Bengal, India, who are vulnerable to sex trafficking. These women don't get to choose their occupation and we want to change that. We make bags, teas and handwoven fabrics and love that we are part of India's long tradition of cotton and jute production. Well, before we left Freeset, and on the left is one of, uh, one of my fellow travelers, um, and on the right, you will see that he, um, we couldn't take any photographs inside except for this one. And this one shows a whole, um, uh, the whole of that central courtyard over three floors. Uh, those are old saris that they, they pick up around the city, wash um, and then strip them and make um, cords and bag ties, etc. So before we left Freeset, I inquired from two New Zealand women who worked at Freeset, just how I could help to support the work of Freeset. The result is that our Peace and Social Justice Committee have agreed to support a fundraising afternoon tea in my garden. Many of you have already bought tickets to come to a sumptuous morning tea next Saturday made by the loving hands of the good bakers of our congregation and I do not count myself among them. Next slide, please. Well, I couldn't resist this one. The last afternoon, um, this shows the idol makers of Kolkata. We, we arrived just at the beginning of the, uh, the festival of, uh, of Kali. So on the left is a statue of Kali in progress. Each artisan, does a specific part of the statue, the role being passed down from generation to generation. And I did take a series of photographs showing uh, Kali being dressed uh, by the artisans and they each had a specific role to play. And the photograph on the right shows one of the many shrines to Kali around the city. Well, that 
um, that brings me to the end of the talk. And our closing hymn is We Would Be One. And let's all sing it together, uh, but perhaps muted. So thank you for choosing that one, it was beautiful. Would you join me for extinguishing the chalice? We extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And our closing words come from Lord Krishna, the Hindu God of compassion, tenderness, and love. To love without condition, to talk without intention, to give without reason, and to give without expectation. That is the spirit of true love. So well, when I was a lecturer in the Faculty of Science, my main subject area was public and community health, which is fundamentally about social justice and equity in healthcare. And one of the exercises I gave students was to talk about their own culture and make a small presentation to their fellow tutorial students. Now, students from other cultures, and we had many other than New Zealand Pākehā culture, knew exactly what to do. But our Pākehā students often felt puzzled and said, but we don't have a culture. Well, sociologists and human development theorists remind us that in order to appreciate other cultures, we first need to explore our own cultural identity. And last week, Rachel asked us to consider what our identities are. Well, one definition of culture includes family patterns, customs, traditions, the way people act and interact, what they eat, their language, literature, music, art, and religion. So Clay is going to break us into groups. Uh, and the first question uh, that you might like to consider is discuss some of those cultural practices that you learned in your family that helped shape the adult you. And what were the differences in your group and what were the similarities? And secondly, um, if you have the time, in their book on cultural identity in New Zealand, edited by Novice and Wilmot, David Novitz asked questions, or asked this question, and asked if we have a New Zealand cultural identity. I wonder what you think. Over to your groups.